All right, welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast. Raf Giallo here alongside Ed Leahy of RT Sport Online. You can watch or listen to this podcast across RT.ie, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and a range of other platforms. Lots to talk about again this week, and we'll be discussing Vera Powell's Ireland, the latest League of Ireland action, and the build-up to the FA Cup final, among others. And we've got Paul Corey and David McMillan with us this week, and we're going to start with the exploits of the Ireland under-17s in Hungary. They were playing in the European Championships, Paul, and this is a level you were capped at for Ireland um, at under-17, so you might be able to give us the context of just how big an achievement this was to A, get to the knockout stages and actually get close enough to a playoff at the World Cup. Obviously, they just fell short just because of results um, in the other quarterfinal between France and England, but a huge achievement nonetheless to get to a quarterfinal. Yeah, great achievement. I think particularly when you when you take into context the performance and the results against Poland, where we're all probably worrying about how the, the group stages would sort of pan out, but to, to bounce back and the two results that they had against Wales and Hungary and also the performances I thought were really impressive just general play I thought we were very good in possession of the ball maybe not something that we've been typically renowned for in in underage competition maybe over the last 20 years but there's definitely been an improvement in the last few so for the squad to go on and to do as well as as they have done is is a massive achievement and it's kind of a sign Raph of of what can be done but the fixture on Saturday night was maybe just a step too far I thought the the Spanish side that they played were were just so polished and the way they moved the ball about they looked like a almost like an experienced La Liga team with with how good they were on the ball and how, how they moved it around. I heard Colin O'Brien saying that, you know, it, it, they're like a side who've a master's in in keeping possession and passing the ball. And that's the way it, it sort of played out. And you see Yamal, who played on the right wing from 15 years of age, has already made his debut for Barcelona. That's what we were up against. And it just, it proved a step too far. And don't be surprised if Spain go on and win that competition because they were so, so impressive. But for Colin O'Brien and for that age group, I mean, I, I played in a team that that went to the under-16s European Championships and a number of those players went on to be capped at, at senior international level. And we don't always qualify, but you can, I guess, put a, a trend together of teams that do qualify and, and then kind of senior internationals that we do end up with. So there's a couple of players there who've, who've definitely made a name for themselves. The great thing is we can track them so close to home now because so much of that squad are, are playing in the League of Ireland and in the underage uh, national leagues. So it's it's about, I mean, there's been a lot of kind of comms around the development of our players now and ensuring that we get the adequate coaching around them. I think that was just proof, Raph, that the players are there. And if we can get the right coaches and the right facilities and the right environment around them, we can be a little more consistent in how well we can compete at underage level. But it, a massive you know, congratulations to Colin O'Brien and that squad. It was a pity that England couldn't do us a favour and at least give us a playoff for the World Cup because he felt like they deserved it based on the performances that they've shown. But a really, really good two weeks for that squad. Yeah, and David, as Paula said there, in terms of the investment when it comes to coaching, infrastructure, facilities, obviously Spain, it's a completely different world. It's a, Football is an industry over there in a way that it hasn't quite uh, managed to be over here. But that is going to be key going forward, that these aren't one-offs. It was something Alan Cawley was at pains to point out during the commentary that this needs to be followed uh, in terms of pouring money in and uh, trying to give the next generation as much of a chance as possible, especially given the Brexit situation, which, which means most of our players and most of that squad that were in the 17 squad are playing here. Yeah, I think it's been mentioned the lack of full-time coaches at our academy level compared to countries across Europe. And um, with the experience for the under-17s, even mentally to go through all of that, that that kind of tournament scenario and to experience all of that, even then moving forward into 19s, 21s, like that can only hold them in good esteem and, and they'll want to get back there. And I think the more teams you can get progressing as far as that at underage level can only, as Paul said, develop and help our national team and um, our, our senior teams um, later on. So th- the more times we can achieve that, um, I think that has to be the goal for the underage teams. And as you said, it takes investment and it takes a lot of work from the FBI and, and they need help as well at the government level. Um, but if we can achieve what, what the under-17s achieve more regularly, then it'll help in the longer run for our national team. Yeah, and uh, two of the players that stood out for Ireland were the St. Pat's duo, Luke Kerr and Mason Amelia. Now, John Daly, who's just been appointed full-time St. Pat's manager, was talking to Tony, Tony O'Donoghue last week. And uh, part of the interview 
detailed the under 17s and we're going to play the rest of it uh, later on in regards to his uh, new role at Pats but uh, first let's listen to him talking about the two players that were in the Ireland under 17 squad. Yeah very pleasing for the, the 17s they obviously had a, a slow start to the campaign and they've bounced back with two solid wins and, and great for the club to have the goal scorers yesterday um, Mason obviously is a, is a key player and he's one that was on the bench obviously previously on their team and um, you know, obviously put him on against Strada when we were trying to go and win the game and he, he came on and made an impact and I think they've, you know, if they keep their feet in the ground and keep working hard as they do, then they've, they've got a, a great chance of, of having a good career in the game. And do you see more of that young players getting their opportunity earlier than perhaps would have been the case here before? Um, I don't necessarily say it's earlier. I think it's it's when they're ready. They're, you know, we're more than comfortable to put them in and give them opportunities. I think... Um, you know, young players can get a bit kind of, um, you know, a bit kind of, you know, I'm trying to find the right words for this, but they, they, they will be a bit like, you know, wanting to get ahead of themselves and they probably feel they're ready for first team football. But I think one thing that we are is we will, um, you know, we will we will give young players opportunities when when the moment is right and, and when we feel that they're not going to put them in, in harm's way. All right, so that is uh, St. Pat's manager, uh, John Daly, talking to Tony O'Donoghue last week. And we're going to play another part of the interview a little bit later on, as I said. But before we uh, talk about the senior squad, Paul, I mean, um, as he was talking there, you know, Mason Mealy, of course, as we talked about on this podcast a couple of weeks ago, has already made his senior debut for St. Pat's. Luke Kerr, not quite yet, but there is that sort of gap between under-19s football and then first-team football. And that's an area that just needs to be bridged, I guess. Yeah, it does. And it's about, I guess, the contact hours, particularly at that age group, Raph, and they're so fundamental in, in developing of players from kind of any aspect of a of a player's development from kind of physical to, to tactical to technical. And we really need to ensure that we get as many of those kids into or at least try to replicate a, a full time environment because the development that typically took place in English academies needs to take place here. So I know there's the likes of Shamrock Rovers and I know St. Pat's and I'm sure there's others who are trying to get them in around their first team environment and, and give them those kind of contact areas with coaches and with the ball and try to do that as best they can. But outside of that, then it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's really trying to ramp up our national leagues, ramp up the, the facilities and the coaching that goes into into these players and try at least give the players the best opportunity of playing here in the League of Ireland. And there's many an example then of players who've gotten in and then gotten the move away. You only have to go kind of go back 12 months to Dawson Devoy and Dara Burns and the list goes on and on of players who've who've gone across. So the pathway is there. The chances and opportunities like Jonathan Daly are definitely there. The league is getting younger, it seems, and the opportunities are there. It makes sense for the clubs to, to give them those opportunities and, and financially try sell them on. So we're, we're getting there. It, it feels like um, the, I guess the key kind of pillars are there. We just need to improve them a little more. Talk about investment. So it's as if we're waiting for the FAI to come in and, and do this for us. There is examples of clubs um, taking the initiative on this. And we talk about, you know, giving players full-time football. There is players getting full-time football already. And, um, to give credit to Shamrock Rovers, the members of the club actually sold a significant portion of the club to, you know, private uh, or whatever, to business interests, I suppose you, you could call it, specifically to fund mm-hmm. the academy, um, specifically to fund the Ashfield College scholarship program, which was given players for the uh, of, of the under-17s or um, full-time there in Ashfield, Ashfield College to get them that sort of full-time experience or full-time with the club up in Roadstone, everything. It's all that's all been done. And I think I think it's getting to a stage where Rovers are not in a, in a position or in a hurry to sell these players on. Um and it's it's gonna to stand to the club. It's already shown um how it, it's benefited the club and, and obviously there's a stage where players will you know, if they've shown that potential and and big money comes in for them, they will they will sell them. Um, but in in terms of what what's on offer for you know a player coming through Shamrock Rovers, you've got European football straight away, and and that's something that will add to your uh, selling value. Uh, you know, for for clubs that are looking at these players, 
But the the mention of that gap between under nineteen, as you as you were saying, and the league. Well, this was again. This is what some clubs were looking to do, as in getting the B team into the into the first division. So that maybe that needs to be looked at again. Yeah, I think certainly with the proposed expansion of the league to have a third tier, I think that was going to be part of it, reserve teams as well as a few kind of smaller regional teams. So maybe that might be the area to bridge the gap. But um, Ed, I was just going to ask you about the Ireland training camp. So they were they were in Bristol, the, the Ireland senior men's senior team, um, Stephen Kenny putting a squad of players through their paces, obviously those that have been playing in the championship and this is only the first part, first block before they go to Turkey first, before the build up to the game in Greece. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just, just I wanted, to, I did want to say one thing about Colin O'Brien. I'm just so impressed with him, um, uh, over the last week, just the way he speaks and the way he talks about the passion he has for youth football and his knowledge of it and his knowledge of the way players react to, um, you know, initial defeats and just not performing in certain. He, he he's really aware. Of these little in- intricacies of, of youth football that often just get overlooked, and I think he he is, he gets huge credit for his performance there. But yeah, um, but the Bristol training camp it was very much a a gap, just filling the gap, really, wasn't it? Like just to keep those players. Uh, the Kenny, by his own admission, took his eye off the ball last year, and when the players all showed up in for the game in Europe and they just didn't perform, they uh, were sluggish and you know conditioning wasn't right but so this time he's got them in and it's almost as if to just check in and say lads he you know this is your program for the next couple of weeks or whatever while he also had the opportunity then to bring in some extra players the likes of Neil Ferruja the goalkeepers um possibly just to fill up numbers I'm not sure how you know not sure how how much time he was given them in terms of thinking about them for the the upcoming window, but you know the fact that he, he he's spoken about Ferruja before and he's an exciting player, and then just other players on the fringes getting a, a little chance to work with the with the manager. Um, so it, it, it can only be have been beneficial through throughout, I think, and it really sets them up now to hit the ground running for this. Like the, this Turkey training camp is almost like a World Cup prep camp. Like it's they're really taking it seriously and they really need to because that Greece game is going to be tough. Yeah, especially in terms of acclimatising as well. And uh, that's going to be the key part of it, obviously, the the stretch of time that they have over there. Yeah, well, uh, like, it, it's a, like, it's a huge, um, it's a huge period, really, when you look at international football as a whole, to have that much time with the players. And obviously, Vera Powell will be looking on going, <laughs> you know, what, what's that all about? You know, because... Uh, She's been so vocal about her lack of access to the players in the build-up to the World Cup. But I suppose we're, we're yet to see what they actually end up um, getting in that situation. But it's just like it, they really are. I think not that you have no excuse to go and and win the match in Greece, but they certainly have no excuse not to go and, and perform. And I think, um, I think they, I think they'll be ready for it. Um, it's going to be a tough game over there, but. Uh, you'd like to think that they'll go and put what they've been building over the last couple of years and the performances that they've been putting in will, you know, let's see if they're at that level where they're able to account for teams like Greece, even away from home, even in those conditions. Yeah, you mentioned Vera Pau there, and uh, there's a significant milestone coming in September now, September 23rd, after the World Cup and in the Nations League against Northern Ireland. This is a huge milestone for the, the senior women's to get to play in the Aviva Stadium. It is, it is. Um, funny, I was just looking at the Scottish Cup final there and the, the Scottish players were saying the same thing, or the Celtic players were saying the same thing uh, about the the landmark occasion of going to Hampden Park. Um, yet, what was it, 12,000 in Hampden? And um, I wonder, you know, I wonder would have a pitodry or something like that have created, generated a better, a better atmosphere. Um, you see it with the English equivalent they're selling out the big stadiums for these big games and that's obviously the that's where we're going with it um, can Ireland's women's team sell out the Aviva do you want to do, do something seriously impressive at the World Cup I think to for that to be the case but you know it, it's it's a it's certainly a, a recognition of the of all that work over the last couple of years 
Yeah, and uh, in terms of the build-up now to the World Cup, so of course uh, next month, and we're not very far from June now, so there's the Zambia game, um, and then as I think you discussed on this podcast uh, recently, in terms of the player release uh, when it comes to the European Club Association, that that is looming again, um, not very far from here, about uh, four weeks on, and then of course there's a, there's a friendly in Brisbane itself, on July the 14th against Colombia. So there's a, you know, the calendar is starting to take shape and maybe not as all to Vera Pau's liking or to any of the other managers as well in terms of player release, but um, it is it is starting to take shape. It is, isn't it? And I think it, it, the squad announcement is pretty much, uh, it, 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 it's it's upcoming. It, it's, you know, I'd say in Vera, pa- Vera Pau's mind, it's, it's must be, it must be sort of fairly nailed on at this stage. Um Funny enough, the little advantage of the of the league here going on might just help one or two players just to get over the line in that sense. Um, but in terms of in terms of player release and stuff, well, we'll wait and see in that, I suppose. But I think what is very important is that game that they've arranged in um, Brisbane against Colombia, uh, a team that are not one of the elite teams, but it should be a good challenge, but more importantly, in terms of just getting climatized for, because Brisbane is a, a sunshine state city. Like it's, it's, it's sunny all the time. There, it's, it's hot. It'll be a tough, a tough place to play football. Well, they could just play in this weather as well. Maybe it'd have them get, <laughs> get acclimatized. Yeah, or, exactly, we're, yeah. we're having a good time, but anyway, at least for another few days. But um, also tonight, uh, and if you're listening to this on Monday, there's a documentary called Kevin Moore and Codebreaker. It's on at 9.35 on RT1 and will also be available on the RT player. And if you want to check a good preview piece, it's on rt.ie. Um, slash sport by our colleague Rob Wright as well if you want to get a, a depending on what generation you're from for certain for people of a certain age uh, they probably remember Kevin Moore in first hand I remember him for more sort of these nostalgia videos and things I used to have when I was younger but uh, maybe you uh, yeah, would me probably... too, well. <laughs> <laughs> fair I, enough uh, I remember like I I'll have to say I was, I was too young to remember him in uh, playing for the dubs the, you know in terms of that sense the nostalgia videos would have been uh, very much that point was a goal or a point he scored. We just bombed through everyone. But uh, my little, my little, uh, I don't know if he's a claim to fame, but Kevin Moore and signed from Man United um, from Pegasus, my old club. So uh, we've got that in common. Uh, the UCD, the UCD graduate team. Uh, so uh, that, that's where that's where the similarities ended. Apart from maybe getting uh, some rash challenges and and. Uh, Stupid mistakes, but uh, Kevin Moran was uh, famously sent off in the FA Cup final, and remarkably, back in the day, they, they weren't even allowed to go up and get a medal. I don't think that in the, in those days. But uh, again, his days at United, you just remember him being such a absolute warrior, and the time he was stretched off, and he put the thumbs up to the crowd as he was being stretched off. He was he was one of those cult heroes, I think, and I, I can't imagine any United fan not remembering him with absolute fondness, never mind what he did with the green jersey. Yeah, for sure. And uh, also this Friday, we've got Shamrock Rovers against Dundalk and RT2 and the RT player. So um, that's our next live offering. And then last Friday, in terms of the results in the SSC or Tristy Men's Premier Division, Bohemians and Shelburne drew nil all. Cork City beat eight man Shamrock Rovers 1 nil. Rory Keaton getting the goal five minutes from time. We're going to talk about some of the. Uh, uh, officiating in that game and uh, what Stephen Bradley had to say about it as well. And then Drada United got a 3-1 win over UCD coming from behind uh, to pick up another three points. And then St. Pat's beat Dundalk 2-1. And on Saturday night, Sligo Rovers beat Derry City 1-0. So probably a missed opportunity there for Derry, given what had happened to Shamrock Rovers. But uh, we're going to start on St. Pat's. And first, as I said, we uh, played a short part of Jonathan Daly a little bit earlier on where he was talking about the young players coming through a pass that were a part of the 17s. Now, in this portion of the interview that he did with Tony O'Donoghue, he's talking about taking on the Pats job and the circumstances and also his sort of early plans for the role. Yeah, of course, it's a, it's a conversation I had with him um, prior to coming in that, you know, he knew kind of where I wanted to go in terms of, you know, my own career. Um, it was obviously never meant to be to his detriment. Um, I felt I could come in and help him and, and then potentially down the line um, get a management job probably elsewhere. Um, but obviously football is a funny business. It's um, obviously the way the, the results went and 
the club made a made a decision and um, yeah, and they asked me to step in, so I was happy to do so um, in the interim basis. And then obviously to get the call to to go in on a permanent basis is is fantastic. But as you said, it's it's never nice when it's um, kind of to the detriment of your friend. What did you do differently, or did you do that much differently between the previous results and the good results that you've had recently? Um, well, there's a good squad in there. There's good players in the building, and it was it was probably just little tweaks in terms of slight changes to positions and stuff like that. So it wasn't it wasn't overly uh, you know major changes. Um, it was it was slight changes, and again just again just trying to drive demands and training, which you know the lads always train well. But it was probably just um, you know putting a little bit extra demands on certain key players. Um, that obviously helped us. All right, so that is St. Pat's manager, Jonathan Daly, who stepped up from the role of caretaker to take on the role full-time. And as he was referring to there, he succeeded Tim Clancy, who obviously would have been a good friend and colleague of his um, uh, prior staff. But uh, David, I suppose as he comes into the role, he's already made an impact in that period as caretaker manager. And there's a good bit of momentum there at Pat's in, in recent weeks. Yeah, there is. And probably a, a, a kind of, a slightly tougher appointment where he's already been there you know he's there as assistant so you don't get that kind of honeymoon period and get to bed in he's got a kind of you know fans probably expect him he knows the players expect him to have a, an, an instant impact but in fairness he has and I think the results being his first game as permanent manager against the Dock to be down to 10 men for 30 or 40 minutes um, at one all and to, to go on and win the game will be a big lift for him and I think especially for Pats after losing so heavily up in Oriel Park earlier in the season to, to have won that game was a big one. And, you know, I was at the game. They they lost their right back, Soiberg, after maybe five, ten minutes. Had to switch around, put Sam Curtis to right back. Um, then Gravosti gets injured. Looked like a bad injury kind of half an hour in. They have to rejig again. Breslin has to go from left back to right back. So a lot of things went wrong for them on the night, including the red card, obviously. Um, but they still managed to dig out a win. So... That's the kind of game I think for any manager you'd be you'd be delighted with. Um, so many things going wrong for you, and you still manage to come out with three points. And what has he changed, David, in terms of compared to say the way Tim Clancy had the team set up? Is there are there any tweaks that have sort of helped rejuvenate things? I'm not sure to be honest. Like tactically, they looked pretty similar. I mean, um, he's not made a, many major changes in terms of obviously he can't sign players as of yet. So. Um, you know, Owen Doyle is still the kind of figurehead for them. And um, so I think it's just, as he said, he, he probably is expecting himself to, to drive demands, um, you know, get the most out of the players that are there. He, maybe he'll mm-hmm. look to do something in the summer when he has time to, to, to make signings. But at the moment, it's just making the most. And I think he's right. I think there is a good squad there. I think the, the two defenders that went off will be a big loss for them. Um, and they're obviously missing a couple others. So there'll be a test there from early on. But um, the start that he's made has been very impressive. Yeah, and then from the Dundalk point of view, David, as well, I mean, they have a tough game against Shamrock Rovers coming up, of course, which um, probably they might have wanted, especially Shamrock Rovers, that'll be looking to bounce back as well, which adds another bit of impetus. But, um, you know, where do you feel they're at at the moment? Because it's just they just hit the skids a little bit in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I think anybody, well, probably all, nearly every team in the league is having massive ups and downs. Like, Dundalk went, I think, four wins on the bounce. And then, you know, to be... I missed the game against Bohemians the week before, but apparently brilliant in the first half to be two nil up, and then suddenly you end up drawing that game. And you know, earlier in the season at the, at the Shells game, they played against ten men for ninety minutes and, and ended up drawing the game one all. And and again against ten men against Pats, they haven't taken advantage of it. So I think there'll be huge disappointment that those opportunities aren't being taken that are, uh, are popping up for them. And it's just a bit of a stuttery run at the moment. And. I think the players are in the dressing room until eleven o'clock. There was obviously a deep chat about about you know where they're going and, and what they're trying to achieve and trying to get the most out of the squad that's there. So they'll be hugely disappointed they didn't take advantage of the ten men and go on and win the game the other night. Yeah, and speaking of up and ups and downs, Paul, I mean Shamrock Rovers, that's two defeats uh, in a row now. And from what Stephen Bradley was saying, of course, and this is generally his mantra, they're not panicking. And um, there's obviously circumstances of the game where they had three players sent off and um Bradley afterwards described the officiating as embarrassing and there were some other terms used as well. But uh, if you take the some of those decisions in isolation, I mean, the Richie Towell one seems inconclusive and then the other two uh, sendings off for Johnny Kenny and Sean Hoare are second yellows. What did you make of the three decisions overall and were they were they fair? Do Shamrock Rovers have a gripe or at least a justified gripe? 
The Richie Tell one is, is is kind of hard to tell on the angles, isn't it, about how much went on or who sort of initiated the contact. It, it looked as if he had a bit of a kick out when he was on the ground, how much contact he made. I don't know. I thought the Johnny Kenny one was a little harsh. I thought the the second yellow, he's, he's lost control of the ball and he's just kind of overrun it. And I think he's realised a little late and he's maybe tried to pull up, but his momentum has carried himself into the defender. I didn't think there was a, a huge amount of the contact, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't think many of the core players seem to even really appeal it, as as was the Richie Tell one. Nobody seemed to be looking for a red card. And I thought that one was a little harsh. I think the Sean Hoare one, given the fact that you're down to nine and given the fact that you're on a yellow card, I think you're asking for trouble when you, when you go in with your stud showing. And um, I think that one is is probably one where you they they shouldn't really have too many complaints. But the Kenny one, I can see why it was given. I also thought it was it was a little harsh. And um, but it, it's it's you know it's not the first time it's happened with Shamrock Rovers this year. They've probably had one too many occasions now where sending offs have really kind of hampered their performances and their results. I think they're playing well in games, Raf, without putting teams to bed, and I think they're having probably sloppy spells that's really costing them. But I'm sure when they kind of reflect on how many games they've played, how many points they've dropped, I'm sure they'll be amazed that they're not further behind Derry City. Um, they'll they'll still be very confident with the position that they're in, the players that they have, that they can find another level. But there's certainly little tweaks needed to be made whereby they need to be putting teams to bed while they're on top and really putting games away. And I think that's what they've done really well in the previous two seasons that they're probably not really doing right now. And just in terms of players in the league and most notably senior players in the league uh, just funny enough just going back to the John Daly stuff earlier he also mentioned in that interview about one of the tweaks he made was putting um, extra uh, responsibility on the senior players to perform that bit more and probably just showed up a bit of leadership and I think that's again that sort of leadership issue must be you know must be a situation because when you go down to ten men, you do not give the surely you do not give the referee an opportunity to make another call like that. You know, just you have to really just make sure everybody is on 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 you know on the ball that they cannot give any 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 silly tackles, any more any strange like any sort of stood show and any sort of late challenges. Don't give the referee an opportunity to come in and and, and brandish yellow cards, whether or not they're, they're justified or not. Um, it, there was a video of the Richie Powell thing going around from behind the goal. Uh, it must be a fan video. It certainly didn't look like there was any contact. Um, maybe there was a bit of a kick out, but there was, uh, it didn't look like there was any contact from what I saw. Yeah, and, and maybe, yeah, listen, they, they certainly felt aggrieved by that one. I think you're right, though. Johnny Kenny maybe probably shows just a little bit of inexperience with that second red card and, and you probably expect more from, from the likes of Sean Hoare because there is so much experience within that squad of playing both in this league, Richie's played away, Johnny's played away, they've played in big European games as well and it's maybe something that they they just need to tidy up and, and tighten up on and then maybe away from red cards and talking about experience, I, I think they're really missing Alamanis at, at the back, I really do. Um, there's probably not say, that same sort of assurance that the back three have with Leon Poles just because they've not played a huge amount of games together. There's naturally enough a bit of a drop-off in standards between Leon and Alan Manis, and I think that's hurting them as well. So, listen, they're, they're not they're not major shakeups that need to happen. Um, I still think that they're playing quite well within games, but there are sloppy moments and there's sloppy spells that they're going through that they just need to tidy up on. Yeah, and uh, I suppose the main takeaway, though, from the game, David, is, of course, this is a second win in a row for Cork City. And obviously, Rory Keaton, who we were talking about on last week's podcast, pops up again, and he really is the talismanic figure. But it's uh, it's a huge win, um, and that has to be underlined for uh, for Cork. Yeah, Cork won't be too bothered by the cards. They'll just be, you know, delighted to have picked up three points. And um, from their point of view, I suppose, they've, they've won their last two, but also so have drawed the team they're trying to catch. So it's... Um, but it is good for them. They're obviously pulling away from the bottom, which is the main thing for them. And, uh, you know, Liam Buckley is obviously in, in interim charge and has, has done quite well. So quite interested to see whether he stays on or whether he, he feels, you know, I think he's whatever his title is, sporting director, managing director. Um, so I'm sure he'll be involved if there is a new appointment to be made. So interested to see how, how that ends up. But he's certainly done a good job since he's gone in um, to, to kind of pull them away from UCD. 
Yeah, and I think the other um, the other aspect of the game, Ed, and this was in regards to some of the chants that were aimed at uh, uh, Stephen Bradley's son, and he's going to file a report on Garda Shiakana about it, um, and it was uh, a small number of Cork City fans that were obviously I said chanting about a nine year old a nine year old child who has had his health challenges and I don't know the mind boggles when you you know when you think about something like that you know this kind of stuff still being in football globally it's um you know as Stephen Bradley said uh, disgusting oh listen uh, has there ever been a game where a team have finished with eight men and that's not the that's not the headline story at the end of the night um it's it's actually heartbreaking I've been around the League of Ireland long enough that I've seen some serious lows in 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 the game. Serious lows, serious abuse thrown at players, ser- troubles in the terraces, all sorts of stuff. I, I don't know if I've ever heard anything as 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 disgusting as that. Now, to be honest with you, um, it, it it's symptomatic of what happens over in England a lot in Scotland, perhaps uh, Munich, Heysel, Hillsborough, these sort of things. Yeah. You know. And the effect this thing, like Stephen Bradley's an adult, but the effect this sort of stuff has on children is just uh, that's that's the great shame of it all. And these, like, I'm not going to call them Cork fans or supporters because they're not doing their, their club any 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 favors, and they've ruined a good night for people, and they've ruined the reputation of a great club on its way back to. You know, to what should be uh, hopefully a, a bright future. Yeah, and Cork City, of course, as a club, they did um, issue an apology on behalf of the, of the club in regards to what that set of fans did as well. And um, mm. as, as yeah, and quickly as well, they were doing yeah, and quick, yeah. Credit to Cork and the credit to the pub and everyone and the credit to the Cork fans. I've seen numerous uh, Cork fans come out and wholly distance themselves from any, any sort of behaviour like that. When we talk about Shamrock Rovers at the top end of the table, uh, Paul, I mean, uh, for Derry City to go up to Sligo Rovers, an opportunity to try and put a little bit of daylight between themselves and Shamrock Rovers at this point of the season, a missed opportunity to go there and uh, lose 1-0. Definitely, and, and that's what I was mentioning earlier. I'm sure Shamrock Rovers are shocked that they're only still one point behind Derry, given how many points they've dropped. And I'm sure Rory was... Maybe not drilling it into the squad, but I'm sure he was thinking out of the back of his mind that this is a maybe not a must win game, but a huge opportunity to to just extend that gap between themselves and Shamrock Rovers, and particularly with the form that Derry have shown in the last number of weeks and the form that Sligo have have shown, kind of going a bit in reverse. You felt that Derry would have had enough going up there to at least pick up a point and just extend that gap, but it's a huge opportunity missed. Raf, um, Sligo have have been difficult. They're kind of a bit of a mixed bag at the moment. You you, some, you don't really know what you're going to get with John Russell's team. They can be really good, and then they can kind of cough up poor results. But Derry, with the form they've shown, I, I think they'll they could end up later on in the season kind of ruining this opportunity to just put a bit of daylight between the two of them. Looking back on the highlights, Raf, they didn't really create a whole amount. Um, very unlike. Derry and it's kind of a game where you you look and you think God, they they put so much into getting Colin Whelan in the door and you saw the impact that he had coming off the bench in his first few games you felt like that was one where if you had him on the bench he might come on and produce something out of nothing because they were really struggling to break Sligo down and, and kind of really put their back four under any sort of pressure or create any sort of chances so a, a disappointing result given the opportunity that was at stake there yeah, and David, I suppose on the flip side though, for Sligo Rovers, as Paul has said, you know they they had actually they had been very inconsistent for much of the season so far, and then found the wrong type of consistency in terms of losing three three on the trot. But this just snaps that run um, at a time when they needed it most. Yeah, I think it's kind of <clears throat> how the league has been. Teams are winning three, losing three, um, forms up and down. But I think Sligo weren't. You know, I think they felt some of those games they played reasonably well and. Maybe just didn't get the rub of the green, and um, you know they performed well the other night to, to to nick an early goal. And as Paul said, Derry didn't create much, and despite having large swathes of possession, I think they'll be disappointed not to. Have, I think they had one shot at target across the whole game, and um, Paul's mentioned Colin Wien, and obviously Ollie O'Neill starts up front, probably not a natural striker. You have McGonagall and and, and um, King Cavan on the bench, two strikers. Um, 
all of the three have only scored one this season. I think Colin Wayne's played about a total of 90 minutes and managed to get two goals. So I think that's something that Rory is probably going to have to try and address in the summer um, because they need a striker who's going to get them 10, 15 goals at least. And um, and that's probably one area where they're not quite, you know, I think across the back four, across their midfield, they look very, very strong. But up front has kind of been a bit of a problem area for them. So um, disappointing for them. But Sligo will be delighted, as I said. I think they're on the run of three defeats. So to... to Especially with Derry coming down, a win puts them four clear. Probably made it a little bit of a harder evening, but Sligo dealt with it really well. And and um, bar the sending off, obviously for John Mann, it's, it was a great night for them. Yeah, and uh, of course Derry City as well. They're applying to get a new two thousand nine hundred capacity stand, and that would be a standing terrace to to be built on the Brandywell Road end of the ground as well. So that would be a huge development for them if that does happen. But uh, uh, I think we mentioned earlier bows and shells. It wasn't a uh, classic; it was nil all. But let's listen to. Bohemians midfielder James McManus, who has uh, other priorities as well as what's happening on the pitch, and then also uh, manager Declan Devine. James, we're kind of dissecting it all. It's probably one of those nights both teams will walk away disappointed you don't leave with the three points. Yeah, probably a little bit disappointed, yeah, but in the end, probably the fair result. Yeah, I think we both had chances in the game, but yeah, we'll, we'll take our point, yeah, and then. Get out, yeah. This is a club over recent years that has maybe sometimes had to give youth its chance on other occasions has chosen to do so. You've become such a key part of this squad. How are you enjoying the, this increased role you've had this season? Yeah, no, it's great. I think probably broke in end of last year, yeah, and then this season I was just focusing on pushing through and in fairness to Declan, he's gave me chances and I'm just trying to take them when he gives them to me, yeah. A 50 yellow card, which means a suspension next week, which means probably you've no excuse not to study for the leaving cert, which has been discussed over the course of the programme. How are you balancing all of this? And is football maybe in a way like a release from what we talk about, the stress of having to do those exams? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Probably it's it's been a bit hectic since moving to full-time, obviously, and since January. But, yeah, the school's been brilliant and Declan's been, been brilliant to give me time off. So, yeah, 7th of June we start, so excited yeah, to get it done. And do you step back now over the course of the next couple of weeks or, or is it important to have something that's not... No, leaving cert orientated. I'll probably keep training. Yeah, I think we we have that mid season break when when it starts. I probably miss that Derry away game. I think that's my maths paper one. Yeah, so that doesn't finish till four. So I will struggle to make it up to Derry that night. Yeah, but yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Well, come here. Wish you well with the rest of the season, and more importantly with those exams. Thanks so much for being with us. I appreciate it. Cheers, Declan. Real derby as we would have expected. Probably one of those nights you'd be disappointed not to have left with three points. Yeah, really disappointed. Um, I thought. Look, we haven't created a, an awful lot. We knew, we knew against the way Shelburne and play it was going to be extremely difficult. Um, the effort and, and some of the passages of play, especially first half uh, and, and in phases in the second half, we were very good and we moved the ball with real purpose. But maybe our final third entries needed to be a wee bit better. Our final ball, our final final pass, probably when we were on that final third, it, it needed to be slightly better. But we're not carrying any luck at the moment. I only see the Mark Coyle and him back and Ali Kutz ball off a crossbar. Um, but we've we've played very well and this is the thing I'm saying. This group of players are playing very mm. well. It's just not carrying out. We've got a luck to get us across the line. So the then how do you go about co- converting what you're satisfied with as performances into ultimately results on the table? Ah, look, we, we, we just keep going and doing what we're doing. We're, we're playing, you know, a lot of teams would like to be in the position that we're in. Um, we're a brand new group that's only come together a, a short period of time and we'll continue to get better, we'll continue to work hard. We have a lot of important players missing tonight, um, goal scoring players missing tonight. So we, we're, I'm delighted where the group's at, um, but there's a lot of football to be played yet. And when we look at the results so tight at the top and maybe a home game away to Cork, away to Derry, how crucial is it to you know, get something significant from that before the break? We just want to stay in the mix until the break. You know. A lot of teams of European football, we'll see where that takes them. Another transfer window coming up in July, which gives us our second window. Um, but the players the players that's here and, and the willingness to get better and the brand of football that we're playing, I think they deserve credit. But look, tonight we've came up a bit short. It was important we didn't lose the game, but I'm disappointed we didn't just do enough they want to. Appreciate your time. Thank you. So that is Bohemians manager Declan Devine and before that was midfielder James McManus who got player of the match uh, in that game and of course as he said he has uh, the leaving cert coming up which uh, I think did he say June 7th with Matt's paper one and of course that will uh, probably bring back a lot of uh, <laughs> nervous memories for people uh, in the build up to that but uh, best of luck to him uh, with that of course but 
Paul, in terms of Bowes trying to, I suppose, extract more in attack, um, you know, Jonathan Afalabi, of course, has been a, a great target man for them in terms of how they play off him. But the only thing is trying to get more goals um, out of him and then, I suppose, around him as well. And Conan Byrne was making the point about uh, the supply lines in that Shells game from out wide weren't brilliant. So I imagine that's the key area in terms of trying to get more out of a Afalabi, but then some of the players that um, revolve around him. Spot on. I mean, they've only scored two in, in their last four games. Um, and that was kind of before they they trashed Cork 5 0. But you, you can see it in their performances that some of their play, like Decta mentioned, is quite good where they work it through the thirds. But particularly against a well organized Shells team, they kind of fell short of answers of how to, to open the team up. And they're really crying out for whether it be Afalabi or Akintunde to come back in and, and just find a little rich train of form whereby they. They produce goals that they don't need a huge amount of chances to put one away. And that would really kind of propel Bowes back up again to, to winning more games or drawing games that they've been losing in recent weeks. But I, I think I think he'll be happy. Listen, it wasn't it was the most entertaining game raft that I've ever been to. Um the pitch was was warm, it was dry, it probably held the ball up and, and maybe didn't move quite as fluidly as you would have liked. But shells are a very, very difficult team to break down. Um, they just didn't have enough balls when they got into that final third. Twardek got into good, some good positions, final ball maybe just wasn't there. Ali Coote was maybe a little below the levels or was just kind of starved of space to to really get on the ball and craze. And it didn't quite happen for McDade and Afalabi, but it wasn't it wasn't the worst performance. I, I think he'll when they reflect, they'll probably be happy enough with this, but will also be very aware that if they are to kind of keep on the on the tails of Derry and Rovers, they'll need to be a bit better in the final third. I think they miss Dylan Connolly when he's not there, just that raw pace to get in behind teams. Um, getting him and, and other people back in the building will definitely help, but they certainly need, like we said it with Derry there, Colin Whelan, they need somebody to hit 10, 15 goals between now and the end of the season. Whether that's Afalabi or, or Akintunde, I don't know. They haven't really shown any sort of signs of being really prolific in front of goal, but they need one of them to step up. For sure. And let's listen to Shelburne manager Damien Duff, who was also speaking to Damien Amara after the game. Damien, frustrated overall? I know. It's a big point, a potential title contender, so I don't know why I'd be frustrated. Because it looked like you were, you could have frustrated a figure in patches we thought on the sidelines. And obviously, with the, some of the changes you made, you obviously felt maybe Bowles were vulnerable like, with the attacking changes. Well, oh, listen, the I half. think parts of the game, especially the second half, if anyone had bits of momentum, yeah, there was ebbs and flows. But I thought we might be the one that nicked it, especially Sean Boyd coming on after so long. But I always uh, look frustrated. This is my resting face. <laughs> How big is that, Sean Boyd and Gavin Malloy back, and such a boost that they will bring this squad? Uh, massive, they're big players, um, but I've never harped on, I think a lot of clubs, maybe it's that time of year, there's a lot of injuries, you hear managers going on, no, this is where squads have to step up, um, and our squad, you would say, has done over the past few months, we've been on an amazing run, lost last week, back in the saddle, good result today, I can't criticise them, the only criticism I could probably aim at anyone is probably me, um, and why I say that is because I still don't think, even though we've been on an amazing run this year, I still don't think we've proper kicked into playing with a real freedom maybe I'm in too intense I always vowed I'd never meet anyone halfway I still think that's the case but uh, I think the guys the players inside I love them to bits but they need to know that myself Joey and the staff we don't bite and uh, that's the one thing that still grates me but what a performance So how far is there then between the performances we're seeing and what is the potential ceiling for this squad? It will continue to grow. I openly said last year that the one team you could look at out of the 10 last year that continuously grew the most was us. Uh, on the flip side, this year we've had some amazing run, uh, results. We've had an amazing run um, in a great spot in the league. But I still don't think with the ball we've hit the levels that we uh, hit last year. So maybe, like I said, uh, the only criticism I have is of myself, maybe to calm down. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. So that is uh, Damien Duff, not frustrated <laughs> after that. But um, uh, David, in terms of Sean Boyd returning, and I mean, he almost made a fairly quick impact when he came on, had a shot of goal that was blocked, but um, crucial for Shells. I mean, they had found a little bit of cutting edge um, a few weeks back with Maddie Smith and also with uh, with Moylan, who had uh, hit a vein of form, but it's great for them to have another option. Yeah, I think with, with Boyd out, they kind of were reliant on, as you said, on Moylan and Maddie Smith and probably push them on a little bit to improve from from the levels they were kind of shown previous to that so with Boyd now back it's probably going to help the other two in the long run that you know they can continue the form they've been in but um 
yeah, I think every interview I watch with, with Duffy sort of takes a different perspective. Some days they're total underdogs, and the next day he expects to go to Tala and win. So, um, but yeah, he definitely puts a good spin on it. But look, shells have been as they have been the whole time under Duff, like incredibly well drilled, very, very hard to break down. You know, they've conceded the least goals, but when when that's the case, sometimes you're not an attacking free from on side. And um, I think Boyd's physicality and his, his sort of, you can go direct to him that you probably weren't quite able to do with the other two lads that will add a little bit more to to what they have. And in fairness to him, obviously he would have been a big blow and, and, and credit Duffy hasn't moaned about any sort of injuries that they have picked up um, so I think he'll be very glad to have him back and, and if the other two lads that can Moylan and Smith around him can continue to show good form and continue to nick goals I think you know you'll rely on Boyd to get 10 or 15 this season um, or across a full season so they do have good attacking threats there if they can just kind of as Duff said release them a little bit more and get more out of them then then all the better Yeah and Paul um, draw the United of course uh just as I think David said earlier, you know, just as Cork City put a couple of wins in a row, draw to respond in the exact same way, beating Shamrock Rovers and then coming from behind to beat UCD 3-1 and Freddie Draper bringing a bit of cutting edge as well. Now that's uh, three goals in his last two games and up to six for the season. Well, he's flying, isn't he? And and the goal against Shamrock Rovers was very well taken, just kind of being able to burst away from the two centre-halves and then he showed maybe a different type of style of finishing on on Friday night with, with the two goals in three minutes, but he's he's been really impressive. Um, I think is he's kind of got a real good physical frame and size to to hold the ball up, but he's also powerful over kind of 10, 15 yards and obviously got an eye for goal. A, a lot of I think Drahada's play and Freddie Draper's kind of return should also kind of be led into the likes of Dale Rooney and Darren Markey. Anytime I've seen them, I think they've been really, really good, Raf. Um, probably two players that maybe don't get enough credit. I think Dale Rooney, whenever he plays, consistently delivers dangerous balls into the box. And Dara Markey's that kind of lovely little 10 player that plays well with somebody like a Freddie Draper who can lead the line. He can kind of pick up bits and bobs in behind and, and thread the play for them. But it was a game I'm sure they were expecting to win. The, the Shamrock Rovers one probably came as a bit of a surprise, but I'm sure UCD at home is a fixture that they would have fancied themselves and having gone behind probably showed decent character to to get back into the game. UCD had chances, Raf. They they certainly created enough there where they could have nicked a point. But for for Drahada and for just sort of maintaining that gap between themselves and UCD, it, it was it was a vital three points and only Cork's goal result it would have given them another bit of breathing room. But in recent weeks, I think they've certainly shown that they can produce performances against any team in the division and they've got certainly the quality of the final and the pitch that they can hurt teams. Yeah, and then on the other side of it, obviously UCD now nine points adrift of Cork City and it becomes just, I suppose, Ed, just hard to to see how they kind of rally themselves now. Obviously, there's still a good while to go in the season, but um, at the, at this point, it's it's looking very hard to see them avoiding automatic relegation. Oh, it is. It really is, isn't it? And you know, I think it's not. You know, you see, being that Marmite club, you either sort of like them or you, you have absolutely no time for them whatsoever. I, I have a soft spot for UCD. Um, but I think they're this season. It's it's just proven too much of a challenge for them, and specifically with Cork winning a couple of games, it doesn't even give them anything to really hang on to. There's to be less hope with such a gap and if that opens up any further it'll be a case of just seeing out the season for them um, the only benefit I suppose with Cork doing well for the league in general is that it keeps the Sligos the Shells Drogheda's all very much on their toes that that ninth position is still in play you know you, you don't want you, you don't want mid-season teams to be sort of safe from relegation and then just sort of coast through the rest of it. So I think at least at least there's that. But, uh, you know, Andy will certainly have a go at uh, getting his UCD boys going again. And maybe after the exams, the <laughs> bit of pressure off the shoulders, they might, they might get, a, get a run in the second half of the season if they don't, if they don't lose a few key players. 
Yeah, for sure. Now, in the SSC or Tristy Men's First Division, Wexford beat Kerry 6-0. Galway now 12 points clear at the top, 3-1 winners over at Lone Town. Bray Wanderers and Pope Ramblers drew 2 all. Uh, Finn Harp's got a good 3-0 win away at Treaty United. And then on Saturday, Longford and Waterford drew nil all. Now, in regards to Waterford, owner Andrew Pilly will now be sentenced in July following his conviction for fraud in England. He stepped down as chairman and director of Fleetwood Town on Friday after being found guilty of two counts of running a business with the intention of defrauding creditors, one count of false representation and one count of being concerned with the retention of criminal property. And in a statement, Waterford said they would like to reassure supporters the club will continue to operate as normal and there will be no risk to the future of the club. The club's senior management team and directors have been planning for a number of months for the event of a verdict of this nature. A meeting of the club's management has taken place and plans are already in operation to ensure it's business as usual. We'd like to uh, reassure supporters charges are solely brought against Andy Pilly and not Waterford Football Club, Fleetwood Town Football Club or any of the businesses attached to the group. And as I said, in the uh, first division table, Galway, 12 clear of Waterford. And then there's only seven points below uh, between Bray and uh, nine place Finn Harps. So that race for the final uh, three playoff places is going to be tight as hell for the remainder of the campaign. And then in the SSC or Tristy Women's Premier Division, Athlone beat Treaty United 7-0. Shamrock Rovers edged Galway at 2-1. Uh, Cork lost 2-0 at home to Wexford. DLR Waves and Bowes drew nil all. And then in a game that's obviously of significance in the top end of the table, P Mount won one nil away at Shelburne. But I suppose Ed, the um the big story in the league um and in that division uh, this week was the appointment of Laura Heffernan as the DLR Waves manager, and she's replacing Graham Kelly, who's joined uh, John Daly's coaching team at St Pat's. Yeah, and this is this is great, isn't it? Um, I think, I think, um. We've seen the resurgence of the, of the women, women's game over the last few years. And I think when uh, when a woman first team coach comes in, it just gives it just gives an added um emphasis, I suppose, on 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 the importance of and the progression of the game. You know, we you just have to look at the Vera Power effect of the national team um and what it has done, like I think Leeson as well, is bringing bringing more players and more, you know, women coaches into the into the mix as well. Uh, from a personal point of view, I was disappointed Shamrock Rovers didn't appoint a female head coach when when they returned to the league. But, you know, just it would have been a great statement. But I think just as a big big thing for DLR Waves, I think it's a, it's a progressive. It's a, it's the way it should be. I think players will respond to it at the club. I think it will it, will, it can only be a good thing. Yeah, and there's a game also on Wednesday with Wexford taking on Cork in a rearranged fixture as well. And as I said, the uh, P-Bound victory that has uh, changed the nature of the top of the table a little bit in terms of Shelburne dropping back six points off the summit, which P-Mount currently occupy and Shank Rovers just a point off the top. Bowes going well as well, um, level with uh, third place Shells and Galway, of course, also having had a really good season. And then at Lone and Wexford on 16 points apiece as well. But before we go, let's talk about the end of the Premier League season, but also there's a, an FA Cup final coming up um, at the weekend as well. Um, I suppose first with the, the FA Cup final, Paul, City are going to be obvious favourites here, but Manchester United, at least for a good clutch of their pay- players, there's a lot of motivation here beyond just the derby element, but to be the team that maybe prevents them mm-hmm. from doing one leg of the treble. There is. I mean, it's hard to see Man City not being Inter Milan in the, in the Champions League final. So this is probably, I mean, their greatest hurdle or the the hardest hurdle that they're going to have to overcome. Man U have had a had a decent enough record against Man City, particularly under Solskjaer and the way they set up, whereby they kind of sat in and, and broke with, with pace and legs and, and tried to get themselves up the pitch and cause that Man City back four a couple of problems. But it's it's just hard to see, Raph, isn't it? I mean, like and City have been so good in recent weeks, both in the Premier League and the Champions League, that it, it seems like whoever they come up against, they seem to have an answer to to how they break them down. And you think of the form of Haaland, Grealish, Kevin De Bruyne, Bernardo Silva, they just it looks like they'll just have too much. Um they've obviously had a, a week where they've been able to rest a number of their big hitters. I'm sure they'll come into this game fresh. And on a big pitch in Wembley, 
the way they own the possession of the football, how good they've looked at the back this season. I, I just don't see how they don't win this game. Yeah, and David, you've had experiences of FAI Cup finals and I suppose the nerves and the anticipation that comes into it. What's the best bet for Manchester United going into this against what is a juggernaut, albeit one that is just down the road from them? Yeah, I think United, I think United will be confident enough, to be honest. I know Paul said Man City have been on an incredible run bar. I mean, they've obviously lost on Sunday, but um, with a much-changed team, as you said, a lot of informed players, but they know they're on the verge of something really special and, and that kind of adds to some nerves. And um, United have already won a cup this year, so they're not going into it thinking, you know, we haven't done anything at all. They, they've qualified for the Champions League. So this is just a real opportunity. Um, and as you said, to, to try and be the team to stop them doing the treble. So uh, obviously Man City are favourites, but I wouldn't be shocked to see United win the game, especially with it being their last game of the season. They can give it absolutely everything. You know, do City have one mind on a Champions League final that you know the club have been trying so hard to win for so many years so it'd be interesting one I think and um, I wouldn't be as certain that City will win it as, as uh, perhaps as easy as Paul might think but I think United um, yeah, I think they'll fancy themselves Yeah and the uh, the final day of Premier League action of course happened on Sunday with Leicester and Leeds going down Ed and I know a couple of weeks ago when you were last on you were talking about um a bit of a grow for Everton back in the 80s when they were obviously doing quite well then. It's a very different time now. Um, but there, there is this sense of them circling the drain. And it reminds me, say, Aston Villa a little while, a few seasons back where they there was this sort of diminishing returns and eventually it did result in relegation. But Everton, if they want to avoid that fate, they'll need a massive reset there. But there's sort of a sense of ill feeling as well between supporters and the board. And that never really bodes well. No, it doesn't, does it? Especially when, when the future appears so bright with the big um, Riverside Stadium that is 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 coming uh, in, in the future. Uh, match of the day last night played out a few other um, scary Everton moments of the past. I think the 94 game was the big one, wasn't it, against Wimbledon and uh, some very dodgy goalkeeping uh, in that one. And even Gareth Farley got a run out as well. Um, from what, I can't remember year, what year that was, but... Uh, no, I had I had a family thing yesterday, and um, I was keeping an eye on on, on live score. And with ten minutes to go, I was going to go in and watch the end of it, and I, I just couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't go in and watch it. Uh, I have a mate of mine who's a bigger Everton fan, and he said it, it, it was hell. And like, I think it was ten minutes of a uh, ten minutes of injury time. But what a goal from the Corey! Um, a cracking goal. I think match of the day showed five or six different angles of it. Each one was just. He hit the ball just absolutely perfectly sweet, so sweet, and uh, it was a great, it was a great goal and a great moment for the fans in what's been an awful season. Yeah, and I suppose David, on the flip side of the teams that have gone down, I mean um, Leeds, of course, uh, you know they've had they've had a relatively shorter stay in the Premier League in, in in terms of their last stint in comparison to Leicester. I mean the Leicester story is kind of remarkable in. I mean, we all remember them winning the uh, the Premier League and, you know, stunning everybody in 2016. They go on and win an FA Cup not very long ago, only a couple of seasons ago. And yet they find themselves having to rebuild in the championship, losing a lot of players that are out of contract, and including the likes of Yuri Tielemans and obviously the likes of James Madison and um, Harvey Barnes, I'm sure, will, um, will leave the club because they're sort of Premier League standard players. It's a remarkable fall from grace. Yeah, um even early on in the season, I think they were kind of bottom of the league and I think certainly myself felt they'll eventually get out of it a little bit like West Ham as well, kind of regularly in and out of the bottom three, always felt kind of too good to go down, but um, it wasn't the case for Leicester and a little bit, I didn't even fancy them to win the game yesterday. Um, I thought they were going to go down like Leeds, like with a whimper, but in fairness, they, they did pull a win out of the bag and put the pressure on Everton to go and win their game. So, they can be happy with that, but overall, it's been a hugely disappointing season for them. I think they had massive struggles in goal, in particular early in the season, and um, you know, Casper Schmeichel being gone, it caused a, a massive problem for them, and um, and Leeds likewise. I think from early on that they, they probably were in a little bit of bother, and the change in managers just never really worked from from Bielsa going at, at the end of last season. Obviously, Marsh kept them up, but from then on, it's it's kind of been it's been on the cards, I suppose, and. And in the end, they probably finished five or six points behind Everton and, and, and not even close to safety when you look at the table. So a real blow for them. And 
look, they're two big Premier League clubs, so it just shows how competitive the league is. Yeah, and the 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 idea of going from Bielsa now not directly to Big Sam is quite it's a it's a little bit mind boggling to think of. But um, in, in terms of clubs going the other way, um, Paul, I mean, the first I suppose the Championship playoff, um, Luton are going to be playing Premier League football, and their their ground is a real throwback to you know some of the more old school grounds that maybe disappeared now. As we talk about, say Everton moving into a new stadium very soon, and then of course your former club. Going from league, well, ho- hopefully, or for them anyway, um, plan trying to go from League One and um, the playoff Sheffield Wednesday in one of the most remarkable semi final second legs as well when they were um playing a couple of weeks ago against Peterborough. Um, so I suppose first the championship playoff, but then also your thoughts on your former club Sheffield Wednesday and the, the League One playoff final or playoff final. It's an incredible journey that Luton have been on from, from League Two to, to now the Premier League, and there's been so many videos sort of circulating on Twitter about the the entrance into the away end and and I guess how Kenilworth Road just differs so much from from the modern day stadium so they'll certainly give something different it, it's going to be very very hard for them to stay in the division just with the resources that they have and and the squad that they have but an amazing journey and kind of gives you an insight into how topsy-turvy that championship is whereby Pretty much any team, if they hit a run of form, can find themselves in the playoffs. And and Rob Edwards has done a fantastic job of looting to get them to that stage, particularly given the fact that he was he was sacked from Watford earlier on that year. So an, an unbelievable story. Um, it'll be, uh, I'm sure, a massive uphill challenge for them. But they'll probably they'll bring a, their own sort of charisma to the Premier League that maybe some of the other teams wouldn't have. And, and there's certainly something different. With regards to Sheffield Wednesday, I'm I'm sure there's just a mass exodus of people from South Yorkshire down to to London today. The fact that a, a League One playoff game is sold out is is extraordinary. Um, there's a massive rivalry there between Sheffield Wednesday and Barnsley, so I'm sure it'll be a fantastic game. If it's anything like the semi final, uh, you'll be in for a cracker. But I'd fancy Sheffield Wednesday. I think sometimes when you've gone through a second leg like that. I think the belief and the momentum will, will carry you through. I think they've probably got the stronger of the two squads and they've got a, a number of experienced players the likes of a Barry Bannon in there who can really kind of be instrumental when, when it comes to the Wembley pitch. So I'm I'm hoping they get back up. It's a massive club. They they belong in at least the championship. Um, it's probably been poorly managed from a financial perspective, which is why they're in League One. But uh, yeah, I'll be certainly tuning in at three o'clock today to see how how the L's get on. Yeah, for sure. But uh, anyway, I think that brings us uh, to a close for today. Um, as I said, there is League of Ireland action on RT2 and the RT Player on Friday, Shamrock Rovers against Dundalk. But before that, of course, and you can keep an eye on it on the RT Player, Kevin Moore and Codebreaker, the documentary we were talking about earlier. That's coming out tonight, Monday, if you're listening to it today. Um, uh, but it'll be available on the RT player for uh, for the next wee while as well. But anyway, uh, Paul Carey, Dave McMillan, and Ed Leahy, thanks a million for coming on this week. Cheers, Cheers Ralph. Ralph.